it's important that we look at our teams and look at our staff members and determine what is their capacity to perform the work. I certainly don't want to put someone in a position that they're not designed for or that they may struggle with. Do they have access to the information? Do they have access to the tools? Uh, do they have the systems? And obviously, let's not forget funding. I, we, you get to choose on whether or not you want to accept the, accept the assignment, uh, stay in your lane, right? This is what I need you to do and not anything else, but I, I get to make a choice to do the right thing at the right time. Guys, I'm super excited for you to meet Mark Willoughby. Mark and I have worked together off and on for, gosh, probably going on about two and a half, three years. He is someone that I think you're going to benefit from knowing his uh, approach to leadership, his approach to putting the best interest of his school district, his students and his staff. He just completely impresses me. He is a real, real great guy, not just because he's a friendly and approachable leader, but he genuinely cares about others. I came into working with him uh, through my software company owner insight at Hello ISD. And I will tell you that that guy never once made me feel like a vendor. In fact, we um, really hit it off on a personal level and I just truly, truly enjoyed getting to know him. So I was so grateful that he agreed to participate and do a session. We've been trying to pin him down. He, he went and got a bigger, more, um, challenging job um, as a chief operating officer for Liberty Hill ISD in Texas. Uh, so he's been busy, been a little busy, but uh, we've been after him to record this session for a while. And I'm super grateful he finally made the time to do it. I can't wait to hear what he has to say and to share it with our community here. He is a great guy. I guarantee you're going to want to reach out to him. You're going to want to get uh, uh, acquainted with him and bring him into your network because he is someone that will uh, not only give you the honest truth, but he'll also give you some great ideas on how to solve problems, uh, to lead from the front and just be an all around better leader. So with no further ado, let's dig in with Mark Willoughby. Good morning. My name is Mark Willoughby. I'm the chief of operations here in Liberty Hill Independent School District. Uh, today, I've been asked to share with you uh, three factors of successful leadership. Uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of background about myself and, and how I got to this position. Uh, so started off in the English classroom. I was an English teacher and uh, head baseball coach for 16 years, then decided I wanted to go into administration. So I spent some time as a high school assistant principal for five years and thought I learned the craft and thought I learned everything I needed to know about leadership. Uh, and then I got my one chance to uh, move up to be an athletic director. And I can tell you from experience, I crashed and burned. Just didn't do a very good job. It was my first uh, own leadership uh, position uh, and uh, went about it the wrong way. Went uh, top down, tried to tell everybody what I thought was important for them to do, uh, and it just didn't work. So it took some time for me to recreate my leadership. Lived in a desert for about uh, three years, you know, metaphorically, uh, and had to restructure my leadership skills. And so learned and listened and grew in different capacities. Uh, what it takes to be a, a successful leader. And so uh, after that time, uh, went back into campus administration, got a chance to be a high school, uh, middle school principal, uh, middle school principal for three years. And then uh, my superintendent at the time said, uh, hey, it's time for you to launch. And I became a director of capital improvement for two years and then uh, grew into that role and then had the opportunity to come to Liberty Hill as the chief of operations. So in charge of seven different departments, Seven, seven different leaders, seven different personalities in trying to lead. So uh, really had to uh, think about what are three things that I can express to my team, to our team, uh, that are required for successful uh, business. You know, what, what does it take to be successful? And this is what I've learned. It's not all my own uh, ideas. Obviously, in our, in our capacities, we learn to beg, borrow, and steal ideas from others. And so this is kind of what I come up with. And want to talk to you about that today. So three factors in successful leadership or a successful organization. Number one is capacity. So capacity is that skill set or talent uh, that is required to do the job or to perform the, uh, perform the work. So uh, as leaders, we have to look at, uh, we have to look at our teams, we have to look at our personnel and, and have to decide, does this person have the capacity to do this role? to perform this work. 
Uh, and, and so what does that mean? Well, we've all been given gifts. We've all been given individual gifts in, in our beings. And that's the gift of teaching, the gift of understanding, could be uh, the gift of information, maybe reading data, maybe a gift of service or listening. So a lot of different um, gifts that we've been given, encouragement, comfort, leadership, mercy. So you have it's important that we look at our teams and look at our staff members and determine what is their capacity to perform the work. I certainly don't want to put someone in a position that they're not designed for or that they may struggle with or they might take too long to grow into. So I just need to think about that as a leader. Number one, uh, does does my personnel or does that person have the capacity to perform the work or do the job? And what is the quality or the quantity of that capacity? So I might have some of that capacity, but if I don't have the right quality or the right quantity of it, it could cause some it could cause some uh, some struggles. So thinking about where do we take those people with that capacity and where do we put them in our organization? We have to put those right people in the right places. And then most importantly, we have to be ready to measure that quality and quantity of their capacity. So as a leader, number one, I think about capacity, my team, capacity of my personnel, my staff member. Do they have the capacity to do the work? And then I, as a leader, have to measure the quantity and quality of that capacity. Second part of successful uh, organizations or successful uh, successful leadership is the tools, tools and training. Have I given, have I um, provided, have I uh, adjusted tools and training for our personnel to be successful? So as a leader, it's my responsibility to make sure uh, our teams, our team members have the tools and the training that they need to be successful. So what does that look like? Do they have the knowledge? Do they understand it? Has it been communicated to them? So again, communication is a big part of it, a big believer in chain of communication. And so I need to make sure that they have the proper data, the proper information, access. Do they have access to the information? Do they have access to the tools? Uh, do they have the systems? And obviously, let's not forget funding. Do they have the funding that they need to be successful? Do they have time? Have we provided them the right amount of time that they need to perform this work at their capacity to get things done? We need to make sure we offer them time. Uh, and also, uh, probably most importantly, that support and respect. The support and respect that we've put them there in a position that we've allowed them, we've encouraged them to be stewards of this position. And so it's important that I am there to help support them, respect them, and encourage them to be successful. So we've talked about uh, two things so far uh, with success, success and successful leadership. One is capacity, two is tools and training, and then the third one is choice. So we all have a choice. We can all choose to be a good leader and to provide these things for our teams. And as a team member, I, I have a choice on whether or not I want to follow uh, the guidelines of, of, of my organization. I, I have a choice to uh, accept the role. I have a choice to accept the stewardship along with the accountability and along with the responsibilities uh, that, that go with it. So I, we, you get to choose on whether or not you want to accept it, accept the assignment, uh, stay in your lane, right? This is what I need you to do and not anything else, but I, I get to make a choice to do the right thing at the right time. And so uh, it's all about taking ownership of that responsibility and uh, uh, making a choice uh, to take the accountability that comes along with it. It's it's a choice to take pride, to take pride in that role and to take pride in the gift that I have or my capacity uh, or the capacity of the team. That's important. And so those are all choices that we can make in the performance of our jobs and, and in our leadership capacity. Uh, of, of making sure that we're, we're making good choices. Um, it's, it's our job as leaders to communicate clearly and effectively. It's our job as leaders to establish evaluations and feedback and accountability and to hold people accountable. Uh, it's our responsibility as leaders to choose to implement training and uh, tools, making sure they have access to those things um, in, the, in their roles. And, you know, I, I know... Um, Mr. Harper, Steve uh, always likes to talk about being kind, and it was one thing that I encouraged and implemented at, at one of my uh, one of our campuses as as a principal. 
uh, we choose KRG. We choose kindness, respect, and grace. I can't control what people say to me. Can't control what people do to me. Can't control how people treat me. But what I can do is I can choose to respond with kindness, respect, and grace. So from one leader to another, I encourage you to think back uh, about uh, as your leadership capacity. Are we checking capacity of our team? Are we providing proper tools and training? And are we uh, helping them make good choices? So I encourage you to think about that. Think about your communication. Think about your accountability systems and uh, review that information with you, with your teams and, and talk about it to see where in these areas might we need to make some improvements in order to grow. I'm Mark Willoughby, Chief, Li Chief of Operations here in Liberty Hill ISD. I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you uh, and I encourage you and wish you prominent success there in your, in your organization. Thank you. Oh my God, that was like amazing. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to use a baseball metaphor, but you just hit the grand slam, Mark. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. No, man, I appreciate the opportunity. I enjoy speaking and I enjoy, uh, you know, just it's coaching to me, right? It, yeah. it's, it's what I did as a baseball coach and, and, and just tried to encourage kids and players and teams and, and people just to, uh, to think about things. It, you crushed that. That I mean, we're going to have to cut this separate just so you can use that as part of your speaker reel because people need to hear from you all the time. And I, I'm so grateful that you agreed to do this for the School Leadership Ripple. You you are someone I respect and admire. And I mentioned it in our um, in the introduction prior to you joining that um, we've been trying to get this done, but you're in demand and you're super busy because you know you you have taken on this additional responsibility with your current district and. I'm just so grateful that you carved out some time to share some of the wisdom because I know the people that actually see this are going to benefit so greatly from it. I just have a few questions I, I, I want to ask you. Number one, how uh, how did you take it when your um, when your leader said it's time to launch? What how did you interpret that? And, and did you take it as a challenge or was it like, well, wait a sec, I'm comfortable doing what I'm doing. Why? Why would I do something different? That's exactly it. And, and I say that because because of the the poor performance that I had at the athletic director level, I, I reached that level and I didn't yep. do well. And, and so, you know, there was a lot of my own doing and, you know, there was a bit of scar tissue from that. And so when I got yeah. to the, when I got back to the campus uh, level principalship, I got comfortable, surrounded myself with really good people. Uh, my, our assistant principals were fantastic. They knew more about education and instruction than I did. So I had a really good team to work with and, and surrounded mm -hmm. myself with. And so, I was comfortable and in my mind, I could see, hey, listen, I'm going to retire here. Don't really want to get back up to that level because it didn't feel good at that time. But when she told me, hey, it's time to launch, I, I kind of resisted. And I said, no, nah, yeah. you know, thank you, but no thanks. And she says, no, this is what you're going to do. It's time to launch. And so I didn't really think about it. And so moving to that director role, heck, Steve, I was only there for a year and eight eight months. <laughs> I know. And then, and then a chief of operations position opened. And, and I was really blessed to have the chance to come here because I had that principal experience. And so yeah. it was, I was hesitant. Uh, but in, at the end of the day, I know the Lord's going to put me right where he wants me. And, and I just have to be submissive to that. I love that. I love that. You know, what was it about when you were a baseball coach, in addition to all the other responsibilities you have, what was it that attracted you to baseball? Did you play it as a, as a youth? Yes, sir. You know, played, played, uh, you know, growing up, played ball, uh, all, you know, growing up, played high school baseball, went and played four years of uh, college baseball at Howard Payne University. And so just being oh, a part of the team, you know, just being yeah. a part of the team. I love the game. Uh, there's so much in it, in you know, in between pitches. There's the game within the game. Uh, so really grew up with uh, my analogies and life lessons through the game of baseball. Yeah. Well, there's a there's a coach that I want to introduce you to at some point who coached for uh, the University of New Mexico. Go Lobos. That's where I went. Um, but Ray Birmingham, I think he is on at least the top five all time winning collegiate baseball coaches. But you and him have very similar personalities and very similar approaches to leadership development. You and I've had the pleasure to become friends and get to know each other aside from, you know, our professional um, day to day jobs. And I loved when we went to lunch and how you shared some of your life lessons about leadership in what uh, what the responsibility you held when you were a coach and how important that is, because they're so instrumental. Was there a coach or uh, a teacher, perhaps, that really kind of uh, 
inspired you as you were growing up to be, you know, you know, to, to move in this direction for your career? You know, um, always had the, the grand idea and the grand dream of playing, you know, professional baseball. But, you know, I, I knew I didn't have my I didn't I didn't have the capacity to do that. Um, but but have always known uh, in some way, shape or form that I wanted to to coach and be a part of the game. My high school coach, yeah. Glenn Cunningham, was a big part of that. Um, and, and, and just inspiring me to be around the game and, and to teach those those games within the games uh, then started, you know, and of course, during early in my career. Uh, as, a, as a high school baseball coach, I knew it all. I was the best. Uh, but then uh, uh, learned, learned some valuable lessons, you know, in, uh, from, from a, a, a college baseball coach. Got to attend some, some of his camps and uh, Coach Skip Bertman, you know, for, for LSU. Yep. And so really yeah. learned a lot of lessons from him uh, about how to coach the game, but also coach life and what that means for people. And so it's just really the, the blending of that. How does how does the game of baseball help me teach life lessons to kids and to players? Uh, and then now it's bringing that analogy and those analogies into the world of adults. And so yeah, just yeah. really trying to help people understand what it takes to be successful. What is, um, if you don't mind me asking, what's what's one leadership lesson that really seemed to resonate with your players that you can still apply today with the people that you lead at the district? You know, one one of the biggest things that I've always um, stressed to our players, I, I can't control what that umpire calls, right? All I can control is how I respond to it or what yeah. I do with the ball, yeah. uh, what I do at the plate. And so it's such an individualized sport and a lot of individual achievements have to take place um, in a sequential pattern, right, in order to be successful. Um, yeah. But But it was really to not allow – the umpire to to distract or take away from the performance that uh, you know in baseball is a game of failure. Yeah, when you stop and think about it. The best hitters are only successful three out of ten times. Yep, the best hitters are three hundred hitters. The major league average is probably two seventy five. So when you yep. start thinking about baseball, the game of baseball is a game of failure. And so in order to be successful, you have to really concentrate, be able to put aside the failures the 70 percents that happen right and stay yeah. focused on those things that i can't control in the times that i do and so it's really taken that mindset uh to to understand baseball and life can be a game of failures you just have to be sure to uh, concentrate on those those things that you can't control oh gosh i really love that that's uh, that's that is just such solid advice a couple of um, additional ripple questions I wanted to ask you. What did the seven-year-old Mark want to be? I'm guessing a professional baseball player. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I, I, I mean, seven-year-old Mark. Well, he was either going to be a ball player. He's going to be in a rock band or something. Uh, there was there were all kinds of things at that time. Right? <laughs> many, many moons ago. <laughs> uh, I love that. I love that. So, uh, it, what what band would you have wanted to be a part of at that time? Oh my gosh, man! I mean, you're gonna you're gonna age me with that, Steve. Man, I was a Kiss fan. I mean, back in that day. Oh. You know, those are all kinds, I love of, it. all kinds of stuff. Yeah, it was crazy. Uh, it was crazy. That's fantastic. Who who played a significant role in helping you become who you are today? So one of, one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Estrada Thomas. She was a she was my first high school principal uh, when I became an, uh, an assistant principal. Uh, she 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 gave me the, the advice: don't take the jump from assistant principal to athletic director. I told her, what are you talking about? That's what I'm that's what I'm built for in design. She goes, No, you need to be a principal first. I said, Are you crazy? I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't want to be a principal and ever want to be a principal. Uh and but she was right. Uh I needed I, I had missed that that a very important step in school leadership. Uh yeah. but then she is the one who hired me as a campus principal when she was the uh, superintendent in Hutto. So Dr. Selena Strata Thomas, very um uh, influential person in my professional career. She has done a lot of work. Uh, with instructional change, and, and she's a she's an instructional change agent, so really helpful and beneficial to me. That's awesome. Well, you know, you talk about the ripple of decisions, right? Look how that ripple came all the way back. It did. It came full circle after several years, and uh, you know, she she had the vision. She knew for for quite some time. That's amazing. Well, I know you uh, are always looking to improve as a leader. What is one of your favorite books right now that you're maybe uh, that you either have read recently or that you go back to often that you maybe um, uh, that might be new to someone that watches this video? 
So I, I, it's funny you ask that because my son is getting into his career. And so we were talking about books and, you know, he asked, he asked kind of that same question. There are two books that I dial, I've dialed in on. Number one, uh, first book I ever read about leadership and, and having a skill set, Crucial Conversations. Yeah. You, have to, you have to be able to have crucial conversations in a very respectful manner, put emotions aside, and to, but, but to be honest, right? I have to be truthful. Yeah can't hold things back. And in order to communicate those things, you have to do it in, in a way that's not disrespectful or threatening. Uh, and so crucial conversations is one of the ones that I would recommend. And then the other one uh, that I've really taken a fancy to and liking with is extreme ownership. Uh, at the uh, end of the day, yeah. at the end of the day, it's on me. If, if I'm, if I've been given the stewardship of this organization, of this department, of this district, whatever stewardship I have, or I've been allowed to have, I have to take extreme ownership of it. Can't put, can't uh, push it off on other people. It, it, it's my job to make sure the the goals are communicated. Um, you know, the accountabilities explained. You know, it's it's all on me. And so, as uh, it, I think, our best leaders are those ones that take extreme ownership. Yeah, that's perfect. I love that. Um, well, last two questions. What does the ripple effect mean to you? It's 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 the understanding that the things that we say or do have an effect on other people, whether we know it or not. Yeah. I may not always know where that ripple lands out there on the other side of the pond or the lake or the ocean, but someone's going to hear it. And so, uh, and, and it is my belief that the talents that we've been given, we are to use to benefit others and to help others grow. And so, uh, that's what the ripple effect means to me. I, I don't know how many people are going to see this 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 little you know cut, um, but I hope in some way, shape, or form I can add to somebody's uh, potential to their career or to just uh, give a little kindness to someone's life. Yeah, well, you definitely have mine. Uh, you are without question what I would call a rippler in a big, big way. So you're making a huge difference. So last question: What ripple can I be looking to create for you? I just enjoy this opportunity to share, Steve, you know, so that, you know, if that's, if that's the ripple that, 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 that we get on this, on this end, you know, just an opportunity to continue to be in touch and to share uh, and to, um, you know, give what little wisdom that I have and, and, and share with others. I, I, I just appreciate the opportunity. Um, I know, I know it's one of the talents that I've been given. And so I just want to make sure that I can express to others uh, what's important. Well, you, you fulfill it in a big, big way. And I have absolutely no problem trying to get uh, pr everybody to watch this because I think you are amazing and I'm so grateful. So thank you for being a part of the School Leadership Ripple program. We really, really appreciate it and welcome you back anytime. If you've got something else that you want to impart your wisdom, I mean, we would love to have you. Well, I appreciate it. I'm humbled. Appreciate the opportunity. I'm grateful, Steve. And uh, if there's anything I can do for you, don't hesitate to call. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.